Okay, I think I think we're just gone six o'clock, so we'll make a start to this session. Welcome back to the Science Pavilion um, here at COP26. Uh, we're here for an uh, evening session about climate adaptation, climate science, and co-design with users. And what we aim to do in this session is to showcase some examples of how that adaptation science with co-design um, operates, has operated in a couple of projects from the UK and the Global South. Now, as this audience will know, adaptation science is absolutely critical. We um, are aiming at this COP to reach climate uh, change of 1.5 degrees centigrade. The pledges that have been made at this COP so far sum to something between 1.8 and 2.4 degrees centigrade, depending on which analysis you favor. Um, regardless of whether we um, reach 1.5, 1.8, or 2.4, those all represent very significant scales of climate change, larger than the planet has observed for at least 120,000 years. We already know that with the 1.1 degrees of change that we've seen, we see fires, we see floods, we see pressure on ecosystems, we see challenge to societies, and those challenges and pressures are going to get worse as we go into the future, even if this COP meeting and the ones that follow it are completely successful and we control climate change. So adaptation is critical, and adaptation must be at a local scale. We must understand what happens to the climate at local scale and how that influences people and ecosystems, and then how those ecosystems should respond to the climate change and the risks that come with it. What we are um, going to look at here is that understanding that local response, both the, 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 the way that climate changes, but also how we should respond to it, requires research. Um, and that research, that, that research needs to, if it's to be done effectively, include thinking about the local communities, the local policy users, and the governance at local level. And it needs to design, be co-designed and co-developed with those communities. So that's the goal of this, uh, this session, is to think about that challenge to use two particular examples, and we're going to use one example of a UK program and one of a, um, a Southern uh, Global South program. So the first of those will be uh, the UK Strategic Priorities Fund Climate Resilience Program, which is in flight at the moment. It finishes in 2023. It's a 19 million pound research investment in UK resilience this, in this country, and it involves close working with users to ensure effective interdisciplinary research. Then we'll move on and think about the Future Climate for Africa program, which recently finished. This has been funded by the UK Department FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, to a tune of £25 million. It's a six-year program of interdisciplinary research. It was co-produced and it improved use of climate info in planning and decision-making. Now, the format that we're going to use for this session is laid out on the screen that you see here. So you've, um, you're in the middle of my welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we'll then move on to a presentation by Kate and then by Jeffrey. And then we'll move to some Q&A to Kate and Jeffrey about those two programs before we change to a panel of other experts in this area. And there will be um, some discussion with those which I'll initiate, but also would welcome questions from the audience to those speakers later on as well. And then we'll follow up uh, with some drinks and nibbles at the end. And I understand that we've got British wine. Is that correct? We have British wine being served afterwards, which in itself demonstrates the fact that climate is changing. This wouldn't have been possible some decades ago. Demonstrates a positive piece of adaptation um, and a change in agricultural practices in production of that wine. But we're not going to be focusing on that until the end. Let's first of all hear about these two programs. Um, just before I introduce the first speaker, Kate, let me raise a, um, mention a couple of attributes of this uh, UK program, uh, one of which is that it's recently announced a cohort of embedded researchers, and you see where those eight researchers have been embedded um, up on the screen here. Um, uh, so this is a, a, a practice, um, you know, not just um, speaking it, but uh, doing it, and making sure we're co-designing by embedding researchers in those situations. And then the other um, thing to mention about this program is this online tool to help policymakers um, understand the climate risks and the indicators, and that's available here. And you can see the link to that program down on the bottom left here. 
so let me, uh, the last thing that remains for me to do before uh, handing over to our first speaker is to introduce her. Uh, let me just make sure I'm on the right page to do that. So our first speaker today is uh, Dr. Kate Lonsdale. Kate is uh, the UK Climate Resilience Champion and she's based at the University of Leeds. She's worked on adaptation to a changing climate as a researcher, a trainer, a facilitator, and an evaluator for over 26 years in both developed and developing country contexts. This is an ideal person to explain this program to us. Over to you, Kate. Okay, many thanks, Gideon. Um, yeah, so I'm one of the two co um, champions for the UK Climate Resilience Programme, um, and we also work very closely with uh, Jason Lowe at the Met Office to sort of shape the programme. So as champions, we have this role in first identifying what the, the critical research gaps are um, and sort of shaping the research, but then what, sort of working with the funded projects to sort of make sure that it amounts to more than some of the parts and so that the right people are connecting and sort of, yeah, learn across the whole program. Um, and the UK Climate Resilience Program, as Gideon said, is, is one of the first wave of this strategic priority funding. Um, and that, that funding was identified after a review of the research councils, which identified that there was a lot of kind of really interesting research that was sort of fell between the traditional research uh, council boundaries. Um, and, that, and also that there should be research that really tried to sort of focus on, on government priorities and, uh, and opportunities. And, and the, the, so the outputs are very much focused on being use, usable and useful. Um, and sort of to that end, this is our sort of mission statement, our vision for the program, and it's about enhancing the UK's resilience to climate variabilities. Um, and it's through you know, high quality research and innovation, but it also is very much about trying to work with stakeholders to ensure that the research is useful and usable. And I've only got 10 minutes now, but there's over 50, 60 piece of work funded under this. So I urge you to have a look at our website. It's very good. It has lots of um, like an archive of web, uh, webinars and lots of information about the funded projects. Because I'll only be able to give you a very sort of high level taste here. So the, f the research program focused on the UK. So that's um, England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Um, it's 18, it's just under 19 million. So it's 18.6 million roughly. And uh, there are two delivery bodies. So half, roughly half goes to the UK Research and Innovation and half to the Met Office. And within that, the UK RI side, there are four research councils. So it's Economic and Social, uh, Arts and Humanities, Engineering and Physical Sciences, and the Natural Environment. So it's really trying to, to cross those disciplinary boundaries. Um, and it has these three themes. So we're thinking very much about how you characterize the, the sort of the hazards and compound hazards and, and then how that translates into risk and how you communicate risk. And then there's a second theme around how you manage those risks through adaptation. And then the third one around cl climate services. So I think working to like through prototypes with energy and different um, sectors, but also thinking about the whole of the climate services sector, what that might look like for the UK, and is it, is it like it's a European roadmap for climate services? You know, should we be doing something like that for the UK? Um, so I'm, yeah, as I said, there's like 50 plus projects under this. So I'm just going to give you four very light touch examples of, of what the program's trying to do. So Open Clim is um, is an impact assessment platform that is trying to bring together sort of the climate and the adaptation modeling and um, and that's very much to support the, the sort of climate change risk assessment processes in the UK and the national adaptation program. So bringing together lots of different types of, of data and so that you can start to think about what are the direct impacts, the indirect impacts, the unintended con consequences. Of, um, and it's meant to be something that's sort of building the building blocks for this that could be added to later as new data becomes available. Um, this is an example of, an, of the first cohort of embedded researchers. So this is somebody who's working with the food supply chain in the UK and trying to bring in um, earth observation data, sort of how can that support the resilience of, of food security, uh, yeah, to, to support the resilience of the food supply chain in the UK. Another example is, this is uh, Climacare. So this is a project that's working with um, uh, care homes in the UK and thinking about overheating. So it's working with the residents and the staff in those care homes. Um, and then thinking about 
what kind of adaptations you could bring to that, and then working very closely with the Care Quality Commission and thinking about standards and guidance um, through that organisation. Um, and then finally, this is an example of an arts and humanities-led project. So this is working, uh, thinking about 800 years of flooding within Hull, a city that floods quite a lot, um, and thinking about what can you learn from those 800 years of history and working with youth, sort of young people and um, the National Youth Theatre. And uh, last week there was a production um, by Adiola Yemetan, who worked with young people and through the National Youth Theatre on, um, uh, called On the Edge, and that was very much thinking about how young people can respond to coastal flooding um, in this area. Um, and then we have a whole set of projects looking at climate hazards um, and how that hazard is translated into risk, and then the climate service piloting and how you might uh, think about climate service um, measurement and uh, standards and how you value cl climate services. So a vast amount of information. So I'm just here going to focus a little bit upon, uh, on how we've thought about use and usability of the research. So sort of traditional research is very much the outputs uh, kind of go, you know, there's, no, there's a piece of research and the output is sort of informs, you know, there's a, something's produced at the end and it's kind of an academic paper and it's, it's, it's doing that informing. But increasingly we, we're needing to much more think about the translation and the signposting linking across different sectors um, and disciplines, um, knowledge, all the knowledge brokering skills and, how you, and really thinking about the application. Um, and eventually this kind of thinking about is the, you know, you're informing the existing system, to what extent do you need to transform the existing system? So it's thinking about that much bigger picture. And I think in the program we're, very, we're, we're trying to do things all the, all the way along, but I guess it's mostly in this area. Um, and sort of that's slightly more indirect, that, that sort of impact. And it's very much on this kind of spectrum from sort of this linear dissemination of information to much more this co-production. Um, and, and the implication of this, I think, for sort of research, research from for the traditional approach to research is that you need different types of skills. So, you know, down that end, it's very much about managing and communicating information, but increasingly it's about convening and sort of helping people contextualize it and make sense of it in terms of its application and really understanding the decision context and how you foster the co-production um, to eventually on this side it's about influencing the wider systems and so I suppose the point I'm trying to make here is that you know are we encouraging uh, sort of researchers to have all of these skills to, you know are we generally still in the traditional system working much more down that end of the spectrum and in the program the way we thought about this is um, and one of the first things we did as a champion was to develop a sort of a narrative for the program. So we call it the science plan and a sort of rough theory of change for the program, which within which the, the research calls that we developed sort of fitted. And it also, that also then informed the sort of monitoring and evaluation plan. Um, and then thinking about how we designed the research, so the requirements of the research are so saying things like your stakeholders have to be engaged in the whole research process from those of identifying the research question to um, you know, all, all the way through um, to the, sort of the evaluation stage as well. And I guess the embedded researchers are a really good example of that because that's where the host organization identifies the research question and the, the embedded researcher sits within that organization and really gets to know the, the context of working in that organization. And, and, and sort of the, you know, what goes into a decision in that situation here, you know, how much time do you have, how much, you know, what, what kinds of information get valued. Um, and then things like the criteria for panels, so making sure that when research is identified, like, are they considering the co-production possibilities or the, the um, potential for impact of those program, uh, those projects. And then the funded research, we have a sort of regular program of, of webinars, and um, we like to hear not just from the researchers, but really very much from the people that are potentially going to be using that research. So there's both people speak at the webinars. We get a, re a response from someone who should be using it, and to sort of say, how you know, is this usable? What is the significance of this research for your context? And we're currently now in the synthesis stage of the program, so hopefully that kind of co collaboration between the researchers and the users will, will come into the, the insight papers that we're hoping to produce um, through the program that's kind of to learn across the, the whole program. 
And then finally, in the sort of evaluation and learning aspect here, the, um, you know, traditionally the research would be thinking very much about the academic papers that come out of um, the research. But if you're trying to do a program on research, which is very much about use and usability, other things have to be, you know, other criteria need to be used, such as, um, you know, how well has this research been positioned for use? How much were the users engaged in the whole research process? So these other ways of valuing and evaluating the program. Um, and then just finally, some sort of reflections from where, I'm, where, I, where we are now. We've still got another year to go. Um, so things that made this easy, you know, we had a steering committee, which was really, um, a really quite nice widespread of people. So it's academics, but also um, our target audiences in government um, and government agencies like public health and the environment um, and also some private companies. So a good, good mixture. And there was sort of got very involved in the research, identifying the research questions. Um, we, we were able to sort of really think about doing a different type of evaluation, so we were able to move beyond the citation count to sort of measures of these sort of significance and usefulness and usability around sort of positioning for use. Um, the, the fact that Siraj and I um, and Jason, you know, have been funded to do this championing role, you know, there's an investment in what I call the kind of glue roles to kind of connect, that, and I think that is really important to sort of spot so, so there is some resource for kind of doing that connectivity um in the program um and and because it's a strategic priority fund you know the mandate was very much around the relevance of the outputs um there's always things that make it hard um you know things like the rushed quite rushed funding schedules you know if you're trying to do something that's interdisciplinary multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary that requires you to you know have new types of partnerships link up different types of people um, and if it's all very rushed, you don't really have time to build those relationships of trust. Um, so that was a cha has been a challenge. Um, and we're, the funding was not able to fund non-academic partners. Um, there's lots of issues about, again, sort of linked to the, the amount of timing is that some of these, some of the words are very complicated. Like the, resilient, the word resilience itself, like lots of people have different perceptions of that. Things like co-production, there's lots of different ways of thinking about these concepts. And so sometimes there's not quite enough time to really unpack what those mean. Um, there is a traditional research comfort zone around linear dissemination, so it's, sometimes it's challenging to try and push down the other end of the spectrum. So I still, I think there's still some way to go to shift um, from a model of sort of the researcher as a producer um, and the practitioner as a user. But you know, we've definitely, I think there's lots of really fantastic examples in the program where progress has been made on that, but I think because of the existing architecture, there's still some challenges. Thank you very much, Kate, and thanks for passing the baton over to our next speaker. We'll move straight to Geoffrey and then take Q&A after his talk. So uh, Dr. Geoffrey uh, Sabiti is going to tell us about the future Climate for Africa program, particularly the High Crystal program, which he leads within that. Uh, Jeffrey is a climate change adaptation officer at IGAD's Climate Prediction and Application Center, and IGAD is the Intergovernmental Authority on Development. He covers uh, countries across the Greater Horn of Africa, um, and he's also the co-investigator for the High Crystal Project, which he'll be focusing on today, um, but also continues to work in adaptation in Africa through an EU-funded program. So, Jeffrey, over to you. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, my name is Geoffrey Sabiti, once again. I've been supported uh, by Dr. John Marsham from University of Leeds, um, presenting on the uh, Future Climate for Africa program. We'll call it uh, FCFA, and then the High Crystal uh, Project, which was part of the program. And this is... Uh, integrating hydroclimate climatic science into policy decisions for uh, resilient infrastructure in East Africa. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share the highlights of the program. Uh, the program are constituted of uh, four uh, research consortia, uh, basically in East Africa, uh, two of them, you see High Crystal, 
uh, Mfula uh, Flakto in Southern Africa. Uh, we had the AMA 2050. Uh, those are the four regional projects that constituted the program. Uh, so we had also the Impara project, which was uh, focusing on uh, improving model processes and trying to uh, bring the Pan-Africa uh, CP4, uh, the convective permitting uh, model with uh, four kilometer resolution. And also uh, we had the opportunity to work with the cross consortium coordination and capacity building and knowledge exchange unit. Uh, this is the CCKE. So the program was funded by uh, the Foreign Commonwealth uh, and Development Office uh, and then NAC uh, up to a tune of uh, more than 20 million uh, pounds, which were distributed across the uh, research consortiums that uh, we are looking at uh, critical issues on climate change science, the impacts and uh, how uh, this science can be used to inform policy and definitely uh, covered a great deal of the capacity building across uh, Africa uh, institutions and researchers. So the key focus was on issues of agriculture and food security, water resources, uh, urban flooding and uh, urban wash. Uh, down here are the, the goals of the program and now we can translate this one into uh, uh, potential outcomes of the program. Uh, basically the program worked to improve the knowledge of Africa climate change uh, and its impacts and how this information can be used uh, to inform uh, near-term to long-term decision. Basically, underlying all this uh, research consortia work was looking at information of five to 40 years uh, in terms of decision-making, and there are lots of pilots that were implemented, as we'll see some examples from the high crystal work. And as I said, the capacity building component uh, was uh, very uh, strong in this program. Uh, these are some of the pilots that uh, were uh, implemented under the High Crystal, and of course several other pilots through so other uh, pro uh, projects uh, in the program. But the key issues here uh, were basically that extremes are increasing uh, in East Africa, not just East Africa, but globally, uh, basically due to global warming, and for us is the issue of flooding and uh, droughts. And uh, last year, basically, we saw record highs in rainfall, in lake levels, and also uh, issues to do with the emerging risks such as uh, the desert uh, locust invasion. So these are compounding the risks that uh, communities and uh, countries within Africa, and specifically East Africa, are grappling with. So one of the pilots was looking at the rural livelihoods, uh, basically to see the socioeconomic uh, characteristics. This is an example of uh, work that was done in one of the work packages uh, in uh, Mokono in Uganda and also looking at the key aspects of uh, the urban wash, uh, water and sanitation, uh, specifically to do with drainage and sewage within uh, two cities in East Africa, that is Kampala in Uganda and Kisumu in, in, in Kenya. Uh, there's also a pilot on tea, how to adapt agri Africa agriculture to climate change. And the outcome here was to improve resource management and productivity for supporting resilience. And most of these, uh, these uh, pilots have actually come up with usable information that can be uh, mainstreamed into uh, planning and policies and also decision making across different levels. So there was also uh, an intention and a deliberate effort to work uh, across projects and sharing experiences and resources. Uh, for example, this work that was done on T was a collaboration between uh, High Crystal Project and the Umfola, work being done in Kenya, uh, Kericho and Nandi, and uh, also uh, the use of the, the high resolution uh, uh, convective permitting uh, model simulation, which was run at the UK Met Office. 
uh, within the Impara program to inform kind of tailored climate projections uh, uh, at specific sites of tea growing. You can see the outcome of the the, res the results, uh, the outcome there. And uh, also this uh, uh, embedded a lot of uh, stakeholder engagement uh, basically to promote co-production of this information using available ob observations but also uh, uh, future climate projection. And also uh, this was a kind of a, a step change in terms of uh, new methods to qualitatively uh, combine information from different types of modeling and observations. I need to add that for Africa, I think adaptation has already started, but at a very small scale, uh, starting with the indigenous knowledge and uh, the solutions that are available. But now it needs to be kind of scaled up with the new technologies and new information that is coming out, not just for uh, the current impacts, but also for the uh, near future impacts that have been projected with the uh, IPCC work and other researches elsewhere. The other uh, very important uh, aspect was uh, production of uh, information, uh, which is uh, referred to as the climate risk narratives. And these are basically aimed at uh, expressing uh, information that comes from the scientific community, uh, removing the aspect of probabilities and making the language plain enough and uh, translating this into uh, simple graphics that can be understood and also uh, providing a detailed uh, interpretation of what the impacts can be like. So in this example, which uh, I say was an uh, effort between the fractal program and the high crystal, there was uh, uh, information that was generated, uh, basically used to initiate dialogue and uh, to be able to work through the implications of different uh, futures that were projected, as you can see on the, on the left. So these futures can help to work around some actions uh, that are needed uh, across the different timescales, both now the 20-year timescale and then looking at a kind of a 40-year outcome. So these are provided uh, uh, differently for different uh, stakeholders and users. And then uh, the, there was a strong component on communication, basically uh, the program has helped uh, to inform uh, maybe uh, GACOFs uh, in terms of integrating climate change. And also there has been a great interest in participation in the webinars, but also in terms of the local level, maybe national level, there has been a lot of engagement with the stakeholders for awareness and advocacy, but also some workshops on capacity building. Uh, to conclude, I think uh, there are lessons that have been learned and experiences uh, that can be shared. First is to mention that the extremes are increasing uh, in the regions of Africa, but also elsewhere. And also predictions are limited by observations and also climate change uh, projections, uh, I think come with a lot of uncertainty, but uh, we intend to improve this through uh, use of uh, the, the CP4 uh, simulations that were done. And I think that uh, collaboration is key to co-develop, co-design, and uh, deliver climate solutions uh, to scale. And also investment in not great uh, actions, but also uh, investing in uh, science-based evidence in terms of uh, the ecosystem and community-centered interventions. Imagine opportunities for scaling up the pilots that have been demonstrated in the program is key to, uh, I think, improve the, the outcome and uh, to strengthen the resilience across Africa. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. It was a, a fascinating talk, learning more about Future Farming for Africa program. So now we, we have a slot for questions and answers, and I'm going to take Chair's prerogative and ask one first, but I do encourage you to raise your hand. Often the first, the first question is the challenging one, but do please come forward with a question. 
so this is a question to both of you. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, you, you listed a number of different types of climate risk in your presentation. And um, perhaps in, from a UK perspective, we often think of flooding as the sort of preeminent risk in the UK. I wondered if you could both say how much awareness there was in the community and the, um, the, in the governance at local level about what the biggest risks were. What was the nature of risk in, at local level? Kate. Um, that's a very difficult question. It's, I'd say well, flooding is the, for the UK, it's um, the biggest one. And one of the projects we actually funded was to do a survey of the um, British public's perception, well, yeah, great British public perceptions of, of risk. And that showed that although flooding has traditionally been the, the main one, heat has increasingly become something that people are, are aware of um, and are concerned about. Um, but it depends who you talk to. I mean, some, if, you, if you're talking to parks or a national trust, they're going to say things like pest and diseases or, or you know, the, things like forest fires or peatland fires. So it, you know, different people have different... It's usually based on what they're, they're working on or what, what they're, what's in their local area. So actually, actually saying local isn't enough. It's actually the discipline or the, or the company or the, in, the institution that they work for that matters. That's, that also yeah. matters, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Jeffrey, do you have, do you, how aware are people of the risks that they face in your setting? Yeah, thank you very much. I think the risks that uh, are experienced in the East Africa context or Africa in general, uh, f floods is the major one and then followed by drought because uh, either we are talking about urban areas that don't have adequate uh, drainage systems and also the pilots that were done focused on mainly slum areas in Kisumu, and then uh, Kampala. So within the slum areas, I think the settlement are so informal. Uh, when we talk about urban wash, we are talking about pit latrines that are not really designed to accommodate uh, such uh, huge levels of flooding. So when that happens, I think uh, you have also seen it just doesn't affect urban wash, but also transport. So. Uh, within the context of the urban area, flooding and the uh, issues to do with the health uh, that uh, are associated with flooding are very critical. But for the agriculture, the most important thing that is being faced in Africa is a drought currently. But, uh, but the people in those settings, they know what the risks are already and you're helping them to navigate it or is it a question of educating them about the risk? They know, uh, I think, what the risks are, but they don't really have access to the solutions mm -hmm. that can take them out of uh, those risks. Uh, there are also uh, a lot of uh, issues to do with landslides in mountainous areas, and people will be told to move away from those places, but some of them really, because of the limited options that they have and the, the not so much sensitization given, I think they will not uh, adhere to that information until uh, things begin to happen and they see their livelihoods being wiped away. That right. is when now they'll have a sense of uh, saying, let us, uh, I think, start moving. But by that time, I think uh, there is a loss that has been uh, already registered. Thank you very much. There's a question um, from the gentleman in the second row there. Um, hi, Jeffrey. Paul Clements Hunt from the Blended Capital Group. Uh, look, I found your presentation fascinating for a very specific reason. We have a, a business in Kisumu, which um, we've had it for eight years, and it provides, um, we started with solar and we've moved on to Pago Solar Agritech for what's 55,000 farming families. It's actually split 30% split 30, 30 fisher, fisher people on, on the lake and 70% farmers. I mean, what we're finding is um, in terms of the, the, the customers, it's a for-profit business. And we do it off the back of affordable credit. But the, the, we're beginning to see changes in the demand for different types of technology. Um, we're beginning to see uh, more interest in drip irrigation and, and different aspects like that. You, you, your research is fascinating in that context because that will help us begin to understand changing demands for different types of technology. And it, it is at the last mile farming uh, community end, so I found it really powerful. We need to speak more often. That's the whole point. There's no real question. But th thank you for that. Thank you very much. I'm not sure I can tease a question out of that, but let me, let me try. And it, uh, is part of your question um, to do, is there a bigger role for industry in this? In, in this um, is that a reasonable way of... 
Do we, do, can we get the microphone back to you? Because we, we are live streaming this, so we need to make sure okay. we have the microphone. I think, I think there's a fascinating bridge in that we set up a business eight years ago. It's gone from zero to, as I said, it's 255,000 people. It's all last mile farmers. But we as a business need to access that type of intelligence and understand how demands for technology change. We're seeing it on the ground in terms of go back five years. So we need to think of, of, of yeah. industry as part of the customer base for these sorts Look, of projects. Look, it's pure as as SDG government. 17. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to stalk you, uh, Jeffrey. And, um, <laughs> Great. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll help you, Jeffrey. We'll defend you, don't worry. But there's another question right in front of you, I think. Is that, is that correct? The lady in the front. Uh, thank you very much for very interesting presentations. I am Horia Judy from C4 Ecraf. And uh, my question is related to, uh, I came a bit late, so I, I hope it was not in the first part of your presentation. Uh, did you find any kind of uh, coping strategies at a local level which are based on, on trees and forest and biodiversity? I mean, some of the issues you are mentioning, landslides and I mean, uh, of course, yeah, you need investment, but there are some local strategies just putting trees or, or uh, developing uh, ecosystem-based approaches to, to cope with, uh, with those uh, events. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I should encourage our, our, our panel to be quick on this one so we can move on. Yeah, we, we had a project that, that was looking at the quality of peatlands and how you assess quality of peatlands. Um, that was, yeah, the, the, sort of indirectly it comes into some of the other other projects. Um, there's another project that sort of is working with local communities to think about how you design planting schemes uh, for to support sort of rainwater harvesting. Um, so indirectly, that that involves kind of using nature-based solutions. Yeah. Trees, Jeffrey, were they useful for you? Yeah, I think uh, there is already uh, traditional mechanisms for adapting to. Uh, the changing climate and uh, it is already entrained within uh, the farming communities to plant trees uh, either in banana plantations or coffee plantations but on purpose, for purposes of uh, managing uh, flooding and landslides I think this, the governments are really uh, uh, fostering and championing uh, these initiatives uh, to help uh, plant trees that can control erosion, control flooding and so on and I think there is a lot of uh, efforts on uh, water catchment area restoration so that uh, I think water can uh, freely flow within those areas and stored for increasing water availability, uh, even in times of uh, rainfall shortages. I think those are practices that can be seen in many communities where we come from. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, can I ask you to uh, put your hands together again to thank Kate and Jeffrey for their contribution? So we're next going to welcome three new panelists to the stage. Um, and um, if you'd like to come up now take and pick a seat. So I'll start, um, I'll start by introducing Tammy Jaynes, who's immediately on my right, so your left. Um, Tammy is a climate scientist at the Met Office in the UK. As part of the Climate Information for International Development team there, she does research and capacity building projects in Asia and Africa, and she's had uh, experience in many other countries as well. To, to her right is Andrew Carr. Um, Andrew's head of adaptation science at my department in UK government, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, and he leads on government delivery of the climate change risk assessment in the UK. And on Andrew's right is Mr. Julius Ngomo, Julius is a national coordinator of the Civil Society Network on Climate Change in Malawi. This is a network for coordinating civil society initiatives for climate change management and disaster risk reduction. Um, uh, Julius has worked, uh, has been part of Malawi's COP delegation since 2014, I understand, so you're an old hand at these meetings, and also played a key role in other regional and international initiatives to address climate change. Um, so I'd like to start off by asking all three of you um, one, the same question, um, and that's if you could briefly say something about your, um, your view of do we need new approaches to effectively co-design research on climate adaptation to lead to better and more coordinated policy action? I don't know who would like to start, but maybe we should start with Tammy on this one. Sure, yes, thank Sorry. you very much. Oh, that's perfect. Um, 
possibly an easy one to answer, I guess. The short answer is yes, we do need new approaches. <laughs> That's a pretty fun answer. Yes, and, but I think what's really nice is that we're actually seeing new approaches being trialed in some of the examples that we've already been talking about in this session. So putting that focus initially on those, the relationships that need to be built from day one and truly understanding the decision space that you're working in is a new approach in climate science. And I think we're, we're learning as we go a little bit, um, but through building those strong relationships, that's when you then co-design your research questions. Um, so encouraging the recognition of that way of working, I think is what's needed next, and, and the importance and appreciation for why working in that way will lead to better solutions. Thank you, Zemi. And Andrew? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's hard not to agree with that. I think it's exactly the same from my perspective. I mean, it, there's a pitfall, isn't there, of, of trying to design things in a silo with this type of research. And um, I think the user-led experience is, is, is definitely the way to go in terms of co-designing, and that's something that we are, we're putting a lot more emphasis on. It's a particular recommendation um, from the CCC as well. So, um, yeah, fully agree with that, exactly the same perspective. Julius, do you have perspectives on whether new new approaches are needed to get effective action? Yeah, um, also to agree with the two. I think um, the way things have been moving, I think uh, when we listen to the two um, research um, uh, work that has been done, I think it's 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 putting communication at the, at the center of it all at the beginning and in, until the end, I think it's, it's very important. Um, I think the research a um, couple of years ago has been missing the part of trying to uh, put uh, maybe um, some of the uh, people that are going to use the research uh, in the forefront in terms of code designing, if, even when um, trying help, help to help uh, the researchers to, to actually come up with uh, good um, questions or, uh, for different research. I think that has been missing, but I think uh, the new model uh, of trying to bring everyone uh, on the table uh, design, um, I think it's, it's very perfect at the moment. Maybe we need to change uh, a few things uh, that uh, might really need to, uh, in terms of making sure that um, uh, the users um, um, really um, putting uh, everything else uh, uh, together, helping the researchers to put even the, um, the research uh, pro, uh, products uh, out there for, the, for other people to also use it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, your point about communication is a, is a really good one. And we saw some really nice examples of that. I think Jeffrey showed one on the, on the screen. And we saw the web portal right at the beginning of the session for the UK example as well. So communication, obviously, one of those aspects of, of new development that's needed. So let me move on and ask some questions to you each individually. And again, I'm going to start with, with you, um, um, Tammy. Uh, what was different about the future climate for farming, um, for, uh, future climate for Africa, um, compared to preceding programs? And what were the challenges that, that you really had to overcome as researchers to solve? Great, yeah, thank you. Really good question. Um, so I, as, as Joffrey mentioned, I was involved in the uh, Fractal project, which is the Future Resilience for African Cities and Lands. And this was focused on supporting resilient development pathways in urban contexts for Southern Africa. And Fractal really came at a time where there was this sense of urgency within climate science to shift from climate change is real, climate change is happening, to here is some useful and relevant information to help you make decisions. And I think we can all probably agree decision making is very complex. Um, it takes a lot of different puzzle pieces to come together to enable a decision to happen. Climate science is one piece of that puzzle and it's only really a relevant piece when it's been co-designed and tailored with the people that are actually making decisions on the ground. And what was great about Future Climate for Africa and, and Fractal in particular was that it gave us this opportunity to co-explore directly with these people on the ground um, and do this co-exploration as step one of our project. Now, speaking from personal experience as one of the climate scientists involved, this was really hard. It was really uncomfortable and it speaks well to what you were saying about stepping out of our comfort zone. Um, it was a new way of working for us and we had a lot of unlearning to do. We were in effect 
switching our scientific approach on its head a bit. So even though we had some really interesting research angles that we could have explored from day one, it was crucial that we didn't bring those prior assumptions with us into the dialogues that we were having within Fractal. So I think seeing the programs, uh, the projects within FCFA as climate science projects, but not climate science led, we, it was not going to be appropriate for us to be the loud voice steering the discussion in the room. It, we really needed to ensure that we had appropriate actors from a range of disciplines, a range of expertise, together in a safe space to identify those burning issues, which could then be supported by existing and novel climate science research. So coming to the end of Fractal now, as, as we've said that it's come to an end, um, this has generated a lot of learning for us, and we've been able to um, embed some principles or some ways of working to ensure that we are engaging um, effectively and collaborating effectively. So principles like building trust, thinking about the bigger picture, maintaining a social element, which can often be lost in our engagements, and ensuring voice equity through very careful and very attentive facilitation of our dialogues. Um, so it's, it's been a challenge, but what I would say as my sort of parting statement um, is there's no going back to business as usual now. We at the Met Office are really trying to embed this inclusive approach to collaboration um, in all of our international work, so not just Africa, but learning from our experiences and sharing that with projects around the globe. Thanks very much. That, uh, as you said, pays back, uh, comes back to the idea of, of breaking the sort of linear model of research and really changing it around, switching it around a lot. That's an interesting example. So perhaps I can come... To, to Julius yet and uh, next and, and ask you about what the consequences of, of some of this, uh, the changing practice have been. And to what extent did these new approaches that Tammy's described generate useful and usable information? And has it outlasted F, uh, CFA since the program finished? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. <laughs> um, we, we've seen, we've lived uh, experience, for example, in Malawi, on um, what um, uh, uh, the work that, uh, for example, Ofula was was doing uh, in the country, trying to involve different stakeholders on on co-production of um, uh, information and, and research uh, and, and knowledge products, which I think um, um, to to our side, um, me also coming from the civil society, I think it was a very uh, important um, uh, thing that we had to also get involved uh, uh, in many aspects to ensure that uh, the information that is actually being generated from different research um, that was being done under this program reaches the, the, uh, to, to, to the end users. And uh, we've seen that um, there are a number of um, um, things that actually, um, I mean, in terms of policy-wise, um, this research was very uh, important because it has to, dr to drive the agenda of policy in the country. We've seen uh, uh, the time that uh, the program was actually being implemented. Uh, um, we had uh, the, 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 the country was actually developing what we are calling the National Resilience Strategy, which um, uh, in, the, um, uh, in some of the early stages of the, uh, of the uh, policy development uh, cycle, uh, we saw a lot of uh, uh, the work that was actually ha com coming out from the research uh, informing what, um, what could be some of the elements that can be, uh, um, uh, could be put into the, uh, the policy uh, uh, research and the policy work itself. So, uh, the, of course, the, the challenges have, uh, have been there because uh, looking at how... Um, they, because we want to inform, um, let's say, five to ten year uh, st uh, strategy development process, but uh, we would also want to make sure that uh, everyone else who is, who is supposed to be part of this process is also uh, included, um, uh, for example, in the, in the research that was being done. But uh, uh, for, for, the, for the priority sectors that, for example, were included in the National Resilience Strategy, the water um, uh, issues to do with uh, forestry and land use. Um, I think there was, uh, it was very important for, 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 for the research that was being done, especially on, um, to, to, to make sure that it really uh, informed the pillars of our strategy. And beyond um, uh, its, 
um, development because the 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 NRS, the National Resilience Strategy that I'm talking about, was actually uh, adopted in 2019. Beyond it, uh, we can actually see that we still have some good pathways that were actually set up by this research that as uh, stakeholders at national level, we could actually still build upon uh, this, this work that was already being done. So um, I think it's, uh, the model is, is still okay. It's, still, it's something that um, as a country, even um, uh, in other countries, I would actually encourage that uh, there has to be that user and uh, a producer interface when we want to actually come to the last mile of developing some of these um, uh, programs and uh, the, the issue of communication. It's very easy for, for others, uh, communities, for policy makers to actually um, relate to uh, this um, uh, end uh, product to what has been, you know, because they were being involved at every stage of the, uh, of the production cycle. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to hear that, uh, that um, FCFA was so well timed, really, in, in the development of your policy in Malawi, and the communication coming forward as well. Um, so let's move um, uh, back to the UK now with a question for Andrew and about the, the UK climate resilience research. So how is uh, UKRC research being used in DEFRA, the government department, and in other government departments, and how can this be maximized to enhance climate resilience? Thanks. Yeah, so I think simple question, simple answer is uh, not as much as it should be, um, in, in, all, in all honesty. And I think this ties back to what Kate was talking about earlier around barriers to adaptation and the work that needs to be done. So the program itself is, is still underway. Um, a lot of the research is still being generated through the projects. And I think one of the main challenges for us at the moment is understanding how the evidence translation needs to work. Um, it's one of the key barriers we have to adaptation across governments. It's something that we've, we've been informed of by the CCC earlier this year, and it's something we've done a lot of work on with UKCR in terms of trying to identify what those are and why that exists. But being able to inform policy teams of the evidence being generated, having it in a fit state for it to be translated in a way that they can use to affect policy, and beyond that, the tools that are generated from the program as well, um, having them trained and equipped to be able to utilize those tools effectively is really the next step. Um, so I suppose it doesn't really answer your question in terms of where it's being used, because at the moment, it's just not being used enough in central government departments. We know that, um, for example, the Environment Agency are, are trying to utilize future drainage. Um, that's a really important project for them coming out of the program, and for us, um, sort of in a more strategic perspective, you know, we obviously are looking to CCRA4 already with the CCC. So, so do, you think, do you think the, uh, the, the lack of, uh, of use reflects the lack of co-design? Yes, I, I think that's part of the problem. Uh, on top of what I've just mentioned around evidence translation, there's just a lack of understanding by policy teams. They don't have on one side the technical expertise to be able to integrate, and on the other side there isn't that co-design as well. So it, it's sort of like both sides need to maybe start to work together a bit more from the off with that end user experience that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so that's really what we're trying to trans transition towards. And these sort of conversations we're now having around legacy, obviously the program ends in March 2023. So there's, there's a good amount of time left to understand how we retain the project's impacts in policy areas across government and it doesn't just sit unused. And that's really the important focus with the ultimate aim of CCRA4. How is all this feeding into CCRA4, um, and how is that ultimately going to support policy teams in, in, in the round? Thank you. So we have a couple of minutes left before the end. If anyone has a question they'd like to ask from the floor, please do raise your hand. I can see one there towards the back, gentlemen in the, in the blue shirt. There's a microphone coming your way. Hello? Okay. Uh, I'm Luis Eferino, a professor at NYU, and I work on disaster risk analysis. And my question is geared towards that. And it's geared towards metrics, right? Because when you want to adopt, a, well, you want to have a huge investment as a government, you want to clearly see what's the impact of that. And for events like this, it's hard because that happens in the future, right? So that's why we have risk analysis to kind of quantify that. But in terms of metrics, what have you seen that it's an effective or, or clear way to communicate to politicians um, to adopt this adaptation or, or, or mitigation measures. Say, for example, save lives, 
uh, as a result of uh, less frequent floods, for example? Is it uh, save money in terms of the money you uh, save by not expending as much in reconstructing or, re or uh, repairing your buildings? And uh, kind of, I guess, intertwined with that, what, what other metrics would you envision in the future will be effective that you cannot measure now, but in the next year, probably with the advancement of research, uh, could be effective for that? Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a really interesting question. So as you, as you just refine it perhaps slightly. Are you talking about the metrics we might use, like deaths or money or whatever? Or are you talking about our ability to predict that at the, in the future? So you Both, both. because it's intertwined, right? Yep. Uh, you want to measure something robustly so that you show that to the government. Okay. People have... Sammy, perhaps I'm turning to you first, but anyone else wants to step in, please do. But what are the, what are the right metrics for assessing success of an adaptation program? Who wants to step in? Andrew, you look poised to go. It's, it's a tough question. It's actually a real, been a real focal point the past year um, for us in DEFRA. Um, and it was one of, again, I keep harking back to the CCC recommendations, but it was one of their key points um, for government to take on around we need to do more on monitoring adaptation progress. I can't speak specifically to DRM and DRR uh, from a DEFRA perspective, but I can speak more generally about monitoring adaptation progress and the challenges that we face in that space. Um, in terms of the actual metrics, that we could use? That's the question we're asking at the moment. And I think the complexities of that challenge, and Gideon mentioned area about local, the local need for adaptation, it's not like net zero, it's not simplistic relative to, to net zero. You know, it's very, very complex. It's contextualized by the place that you're trying to assess for the adaptation. So that's what we're doing research on at the moment with the OECD. We're funding a good bit of research there to try and bottom that out off the back of the CCC's recommendations. Um, I think. It's just, it's, it's one of those things that it's a million dollar question and, and people need to manage their expectations about what the art of the possible is for, for actually monitoring adaptation progress. But um, I think with the, the increase in sort of awareness um, on adaptation alongside net zero now over the past year um, has really put the, the burner up people to try and drive forward and close that evidence gap on what metrics we need. Um, and the CCC already do a great job on that, so we're working with them more from a domestic perspective to try and develop the framework for that going forward as we build up to the next national adaptation program as part of our statutory cycle in the UK. Thank you. It um, seems to me like money and health outcomes, they're two pretty strong metrics. So uh, yeah, I'd probably go I, in the way of what you were about to say no, to No, me, no, no, it's but, fine. I've, all, all I would like to add to that, again, it's probably not an answer to the question, but yet another question. Um, because I, I agree, in terms of the metrics that we use to, to deem whether or not this approach is successful, they probably aren't fit for purpose because it is, it is hard to, to measure what is the impact of building these really strong relationships from the get-go and, and what is the impact to, um, from working in a transdisciplinary way. The metrics that we use currently in projects are probably not designed to capture that, so it'd be great to hear more from, from the work that you're doing on, on whether there's anything we can do on an international scale as well to tweak how we're measuring the success of these projects. Yeah, two other quick points on that as well. So you mentioned the sort of key high level metrics that could be proposed around health and money. The other issue is the balance between complexity and simplicity. And, and I think there's a demand, especially from the higher echelons of simplistic metrics for it to, to be able to articulate what's happening on adaptation. It just doesn't work like that in, in my experience. But then if you go too complex, things get into the weeds and, and it's really hard to translate. And the second point is around causality. A lot, there's a lot of metrics out there, but are they actually measuring adaptation progress or are they just general metrics um, for, for something else and them being misrepresented, misrepresented? A lot of metrics and indicators programs across the world that we've assessed over the past year, they've actually been deemed that a lot of the metrics aren't applicable for adaptation. They're, they've been assigned to it, but it's not actually appropriate. So that's another challenge as well, bottoming that out. Well, I think we're being, uh, we're being piped out of the end of this session with bagpipe music, so we have reached the end of this slot. Um, I just wanted to um, thank all our speakers. It's been a wonderful introduction to the way that you can invert the linear way of doing research. Think of new ways of really getting down to the local, co-designing so that the research that you do in a program delivers effectively for the adaptation outcomes that we want. Seen some wonderful examples of that, and I'd just like us to put our hands together one last time to thank Kate and Jeffrey and Tammy and Andrew and Julius for everything they've said today. Thanks very much.